down but not out. That is the state of the South African economy. The contraction this year will be four times worse at least than it was in 2009 when the economy shrank by 2%. This year, a contraction of at least 8 to 9%. As economic activity begins to take hold in South Africa, following the lifting of the worst of the regulations associated with trying to stop the spread of COVID-19. Tonight on Taking Stock, three guests for you, the Chief Executive of SPA will talk to Corruption Watch and to a top economist about the outlook. All of that is coming up this evening on Taking Stock. Our first guest this evening is Graham O'Connor, Chief Executive of SPA. Now, SPA is an interesting business in that the SPA group really is just a manager of massive warehouses, distribution centers, which service hundreds of independent retailers that happen to have the SPA logo above their doors. They also, of course, uh, may operate a build it, and of course, critically in this time, a tops store. Graham O'Connor, I mean, what happened with liquor sales? They were banned in March, briefly resurrected, banned again, and then in the last two weeks, we've seen them resume again. Just paint the picture for me, if you would. Well, obviously, when the lockdown was announced, we had record sales. People just went crazy buying into the lockdown, expecting it to go for three weeks. And, uh, of course, when five weeks came, well, it was big drama. And then I think it ended up at like six or seven weeks. And then we reopened again, a lot of engagement with government and a lot of consultation, which was great. So that we could do it orderly. Um, we were delighted with the way customers behaved, as were government. And then, of course, suddenly one Sunday night, they come and say, sorry, it's all closed. And that really caused a lot of the drama because... Up until that point, there'd been a lot of cooperation back and forth. And then just to suddenly close caught all of us unawares. I mean, all the consumers, well, people were really irritated. And uh, I think rightfully so. So that was really a big debacle. And then we started engaging a great deal with government about the reopening and the like. And they were, it was down to you know, policing issues and, and uh, health issues, when in actual fact what we needed was business. And you know, I've been singing the same tune all along. I mean, fortunately, SPA, we've been open from the start all the way through. But to start with, we have 26% uh, closure with Build It, with Tops, with Hot Meal Replacement, and with cigarettes. Um, so those poor manufacturers on cigarettes and on, on liquor and on the Build It side, um, we really felt sorry for them. And we engaged with them a great deal to try and get those eggs of the business open. Graham, here's the thing. I mean, you've got Build It, which is DIY, and that was banned yeah. for a while. Um, the top stores were banned for a while, and then the hot food, and people got terribly excited over the, the refusal of government to allow the sale of hot chickens, but it went bigger than that. That's a massive revenue hit uh, for, yeah. for the spa group. No, it was enormous. Um, and to start with, obviously, it hurt us a great deal because um, Build It was closed as well. Fortunately, that was only one month. And they've come back really strongly, thank goodness. So really strong sales once they opened in May, June, and July, um, and running into August still, uh, much, much better than pre-lockdown, actually. And I think it really showed with the protocols which we adopted and our build of retailers adopted, that worked out really well. So we were really pleased about that. And fortunately, government opened uh, that earlier than expected. Have you managed to make up for the shortfall then that you suffered in lockdown within the build it environment? No, definitely not. Because you know, one month closure is enormous, obviously. So, no, we haven't yet. Um, we're clawing our way back from a negative uh, place. On the spa side, we had really strong sales in other departments um, during the lockdown. And then, of course, the big boost when liquor opened helped us enormously. Not enough, though. And uh, hot meal replacement and, and, and daily operations, people are still skeptical about that because of the, of the whole COVID scenario um, with that. So, and now cigarettes being really strong. Uh, and what sort of impact? I mean, if you lose, let's say effectively an eight, maybe it was 10 weeks of sales of cigarettes and alcohol, what is the impact on the spa group? I mean, on the independent retailers, the mom and pop shops on, in our suburbs, the guys who operate these uh, places, where a large part of their profit comes from margin that they can make on cigarettes and on alcohol. 
Yeah, I mean, fortunately, with our smaller stores and more convenient, people stayed away from the big centers. And so we got a, a, a bigger than our share, actually, of offtake in that period. But it didn't make up for what we couldn't sell. We were still a bit behind. But I must say, we're far better off where we are now than if you had said to me at the end of March as we entered the lockdown, this is where we would be at the, at the middle of August. I would have said not in 100 years. And so we far better off than we expected to be. Well, that's a little piece of good news. Are you ready for the potential of lockdowns, maybe area-specific lockdowns, if there was an outbreak in a particular suburb or a region or a province, um, to re-implement those lockdowns once again? It's a horrible prospect to consider, but it must be part of your scenario plan. Well, yeah, we, we, we are ready. I mean, we've had really strong protocols. We had strong engagement with government. But I don't think that's the answer. I think that policing is the answer. I think that you know, it's really a matter of policing with what's taking place. And uh, I think they're going a lot for the soft targets as opposed for the more difficult targets. So what is your best case scenario then for the full year of 2020 when you look at the huge negative impact that the lockdowns and some of the more draconian impl implications of lockdowns have had then on the spa business and on your retailers who in their communities are big buyers of products and services and employers? Yeah. Look, ironically, um, Bruce, I'm more interested in the total economy. I mean, obviously, I'd love spa to do well. But more importantly for me is South Africa gets back to work and starts operating because I'm really concerned about the future and what's happening with unemployment. You know, we saw the last stat, 3 million people unemployed, and that's disastrous for us. Now, the fact that we're doing well relatively is great for us, but it's not great for the economy, and that's actually more important for me. So you know, we've been pushing government saying open business. When we engage with Minister Patel, we're saying open business. Don't close and rather err on the side of, of uh, having business open than not. And so we're pressurizing him very strongly on that front. And I think that's the right approach to, to make. And on the other side is to make sure that people are following the right behavior. Social distancing, wearing a mask, that's absolutely crucial. And we've been very, very strong on that, um, both at retail, wholesale, and at, at our central office. Graham O'Connor, thank you very much indeed. Chief Executive of the Spa Group on Taking Stock this evening. In a moment, the illicit economy has had probably the biggest boost of all during these lockdowns. We'll find out about the criminal networks underpinning those and the huge benefit that it has received. And we'll wrap it up this evening with Gina Stuman from Citibank looking at the consequences. Graham O'Connor saying he's concerned about the economy. She will take us through the bad, the ugly and the disastrous of the numbers coming up this evening on Taking Stock. Well, on to Malusi Ngala this evening. He is a researcher at Corruption Watch. Corruption Watch, deeply concerned, of course, about the state of the criminal networks in South Africa, which have received a huge boost as a result of the bans and many people's refusal to collaborate with those bans and pay extraordinary prices for things like cigarettes and alcohol during lockdown. Mulusi, give me a picture, please, as to what has happened to those criminal networks, the syndicates that have capitalized hugely, we're told, on the illicit trade that was happening during lockdowns. There are issues where people are selling illicit cigarettes, people also selling illicit um, alcohol, or some, in some instances, people are actually make their home, home brews and it's actually sold at exorbitant prices. But further to that, we have people that are actually smuggling in um, illicit, um, illicit cigarettes and alcohols from outside South Africa. So these are, of course, things that are going into millions of rands. And in some instances, it does, of course, affect what, we, what the government can actually get in terms of income tax. When you consider the way criminal networks work generally, um, when you create a vacuum, that vacuum is generally going to be filled by people who can operate in the illicit economy and can operate effectively. Typically, what is it that happens um, to criminal networks during times like this? Um, they, they're able to um, establish themselves 
uh, based on the finance and the economics of the day. Um, there's always a need, as you know, there's a niche, there's a market for these kind of products and people are reliant on them. So what we then find that in some situations is that once people are actually able to prop themselves up, these criminals, then they are able then to um, branch out into other avenues and have a greater um, impact on, on government issues, for example. So this is the classic scenario that we had when, when we were dealing with state capture, for example, during the tenure that we call tech, um, state capture's corruption watch. When we, we look at these criminal networks, and I mean, booze and cigarettes become a really easy funding mechanism for much more serious crimes. And invariably, um, when you are running a criminal network, you need sources of income. And when you take the usual sources of purchasing liquor and cigarettes, for example, out of the reach of ordinary citizens, and you then give, I don't know, uh, extramural activities <laughs> to the gangsters, they use those cash flows to fund other illicit activities. And actually, we worsen South Africa's crime situation as a result. Um, we, we, well, not recently, uh, late last year, I actually released a report speaking about police corruption. And one of the things that we looked at in that report had to do with how the police were colluding with criminal networks, drug dealers in some instances, and we, we learned that, you know, this is how corruption actually manifests because some of these drug dealers are more than willing to pay bribes to officials to make sure that dockets disappear and to actually run communities in and around Johannesburg, uh, the capital as well, and also um, Cape Town. So this, of course, has a great impact on what's happening on, to the citizens out there in terms of how people access the justice system, because in some instances where people do have problems, no one is willing to listen and no one really cares about that. And that's why it becomes the, the real crisis, of course, in an environment where people were prepared to pay 150, 180, 200 rand for a box of cigarettes and considerably over the odds for bottles of alcohol, some of it home brewed, some of it known brands that people have managed to acquire. It helps them to establish criminal networks. To Malusi Ndala this evening, thank you very much for joining us on Taking Stock. In a moment, Gina Skuman at Citibank, the broad economic implications of lockdown and how we dig ourselves out of the pit that we've created for the country. That's coming up next. Well, on to the tough part of the conversation this evening, because while things may be beginning to get better in the real economy, Graham O'Connor talking about how month on month on month things are improving, the real damage to the economy has been deep and it's been real. And for many people, it'll be permanent because they won't ever go back to work again. Gina Skuman is the South Africa economist at Citibank. We're looking at a contraction this year. I mean, there have been huge estimates and variations, Gina, but I mean, the most credible estimates are suggesting eight, eight and a half percent decline for the full year of 20, uh, 2020. And it's been, there's not been a year like this since 1919. Yes, absolutely, Bruce. And I think we're all very much aware that even going into this crisis, going into a year contracting anywhere between eight and nine percent, we were already in a recession and already on almost a 10 year downward trajectory for, for GDP growth. So we couldn't have been in a weaker position if we had tried. Um, and it does complicate the recovery going forward. It's not as if South Africa has a lot of switches that can just uh, be flipped in order to, to stimulate the economy very quickly. So we will recover. It will look better in, in the second half of the year. It will also look better in 2020 21 because the numbers on a on a growth basis will, will what we call bounce you know they have to bounce but i think where it gets more complicated is trying to work out when this economy can go back to pre-covid levels 
then and we'll even, know that and even pre-covid levels i mean pre-covid levels relative to the rest of the world while the rest of the world was progressing after the global financial crisis and making gains each and every single year we were in real terms going backwards because our population growth was doing that and our economic growth was doing that and the gap was getting bigger and bigger all of us on average were getting poorer every year probably for that decade you refer to absolutely and you know negative real per capita growth in an emerging market for more than three years uh, typically leads to political and policy changes that are more rapid than what we've seen in the past. I also think that while we look at the recovery for South Africa in the second half of the year in 20 2021, you also have to keep in mind what's happening on the political timeline. I mean, next year we've got the local elections. You know, what kind of spanner in the works could that throw in for an ANC government that's trying desperately to gain support from the population to do sometimes some very difficult things which aren't very popular? Or if we are going to listen to what at least our finance minister suggests. Um, those are things that you have to try to weave into all of this. And I must admit, I have never seen South Africa in such a thick ideology debate as it is right now. You know, the fiscal policy, should we spend or should we cut spending? Monetary policy, should we cut interest rates or should we not cut interest rates? Should we do QE, should we not do QE? And it's always interesting that we have these debates in the middle of a crisis. And, and the other thing I would add is, where is the, the big debate on, on, on what type of growth policy we should be doing? You know, if you come to the, to the real big side of this, it's not so much about monetary policy because there's only so much they can do. You know, their core objective is price stability. And if you have price stability, well, that's one of the stars that have to be aligned in order to grow. And I think we've got that. Fiscal policy, of course, has a view that if they cut the expenditure that never really gave us much growth, then of course they're going to drop the risk premium in South Africa, which basically means they're going to look for more FX stability and stability when it comes to things like investment in our financial markets. So you can also argue they've got that. So where's the missing piece? It's the support from cabinet to do these type of things in the face of an economy that has not grown for a decade, has now had a crisis, has had negative real per capita growth, and is facing a very difficult political timeline. You have to ask yourself, Gina, whether or not the, the survival instinct of the politician finally does begin to kick in and realize that the only way that this government is going to find and make itself electable at the next general elections three years from now is going to be if there is a marked recovery and the people's lives on average are improving. Otherwise, it's on a hiding to nothing. And there are not too many populist measures you can take to ensure that that actually happens. You're going to have to make hard calls and make them sooner rather than later to get that recovery in place, you would think. Absolutely. I'd also argue, though, that we're coming off actually a very low base. You know, it doesn't take much from where we are right now to be in a slightly better place in three years' time. You know, if we're expecting 1.7 million jobs lost through 2020 because of the COVID-19 crisis, then in three years' time, you want to see a positive job trend. You, you're not necessarily going to make up all those 1.7 million jobs, but you want to be sure that you make up some of them so that people can visibly see that there's something going on. You want South Africa's GDP growth rate after 2021, because remember next year, it's going to bounce above 2%, so it's going to look nice. But from 2022 onwards, you want to be above at least 1%. Yeah. You know, that's not asking much of an economy that has been able to do that in the past. But so much of this depends on the state's capacity to do some basic things, and that is to give policy certainty on things like spectrum, on resources, on energy, really, really simple stuff in the bigger scheme of things, um, and then allow the private sector to do what it does, and that is to generate growth, because in an environment where opportunity presents itself, the private sector will step into that breach and will seek to capitalize on the opportunity. Yet there is a pet aversion within government to allow the private sector any kind of leeway at all, it would seem, to benefit from the economy. Yes, absolutely. So I think, you know, when we talk about these reforms, there are two types. They're, they're the new ideas, and then there's getting rid of the bad ways from the past. You know, even if you just do that, South Africa would be better off in the future. And that's why I think what's clearly having 
to be uh, monitored very closely over the next 12 to 18 months, which I think we're going to hear a lot about in the MTBPS uh, budget coming up in October, is implementation. Because um, we have spoken for 10 years about what's gone wrong, what needs to be done. You know, government has a plan. I mean, no, not just one plan. They've got many plans. It's so it's not about what to do. It's about whether it can be done. And implementation is going to be absolutely key over the next 12 to 18 months. Otherwise, we might as well just throw our hands up in the air. No, but again, it, it comes down to a question of political survival, and you would think that logic will kick in. Give me your best case scenario here. We keep hearing about the private sector saying it wants to help with government, it wants to invest, it wants to make uh, the state more capable of doing its job, and it's willing to step into any breaches that may exist. The state keeps talking about infrastructure spend as if it's this kind of New Deal magic wand that Roosevelt waved in the 1930s. Unfortunately, the gap between rhetoric promises and delivery is so vast that nobody really believes them. What's your best case scenario for us from here? I think I could probably summarize it to maybe one thing to watch. Uh, I think if you watch the public sector wage bill, not just um, the reopening of the current year, which we're sitting in right now and how that goes, but rather how the public sector negotiations go between the end of this year into April 2021, because that will set the scene for how government and labor are able to cooperate with business in mind. Because if that negotiation goes well for the country, and by that I mean we have to reduce the size of the public sector wage bill, it doesn't mean we need massive amounts of jobs cuts from the public sector. But there is a very important political signal that would be sent if Labour was willing to cooperate with what government needs, which is basically inflation-linked wage increases going forward. From there on, South Africa gets to buy itself a bit more time because in the minds of foreign investors, particularly, never mind even domestics, I can tell you right now, by that going well, they will look at South Africa and go, well, maybe there's something here because that is credibility and that's really all we're looking for. We're not going to get a lot of growth from any reform measures very soon because reform measures take a long time. But it's the, the credibility that pours into the confidence that stops South Africa from um, seeing investment erode further. I mean, that really, I know it sounds like we're not, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel here, but that is the best case scenario because it will give us more time to get those reforms enacted to actually see growth from them. That said, the best case scenario is not necessarily my central case scenario. Um, no. Realistically, um, I, I do think that I'm happy to give government and treasury a little bit of credit here in playing hardball in these public sector wage negotiations. And, and they might actually manage to get that right. What I'm concerned about is the other types of spending. Trying to do zero-based budgeting, we've seen from our EM peers, particularly Mexico in 2016, it's all kind of window dressing. You know, it's, it's great in theory, but in practice it's very difficult. And rather, I think it's a signal from, again, Tito Mbaweni, our finance minister, to say, I have a big problem because I'm not getting sufficient support from the department in trying to reduce expenditure. Not expenditure that keeps poverty in check not expenditure that actually creates growth because those we're happy to keep. We're talking about expenditure that is just inefficient. That is a negative multiplier effect on growth. If you can find a way to correct that, I can tell you right now, we can happily exist above 1% GDP growth for at least another two years past 2021 and have a lot of tolerance still to work with from investors, both fixed investors and then also financial market investors. And that is where we're going to have to leave it. Thank you very much to Gina Skuman, who is the South Africa economist for Citibank in South Africa. Thank you very much for joining us this evening on Taking Stock. Well, that's it for Taking Stock this evening. My thanks to Graham O'Connor, the Chief Executive of SPA. Also to Mulusi Ngala, who is with Corruption Watch, and to Dina Skuman, the South Africa economist for Citigroup, giving us perspective on the huge trials, tribulations, challenges, and opportunities 
facing South Africa as we on the downward stretch toward what we hope will be a good Christmas holiday and a better 2021. That's it from Taking Stock for this evening. Till next time, bye-bye.